Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Moore and I am the webcast producer at LCGC and your moderator for today's live broadcast of Oktoberfest webinar, Sample a New Solution for Aroma Characterization of Beer. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LCGC and sponsored by Perkin Elmer Incorporated. Perkin Elmer is a global leader focused on making a difference for better human health and a safer environment. They create solutions that help detect, prevent, and cure threats to human and environmental health. Perkin Elmer is dedicated to the quality and sustainability of the environment. With their analytical instrumentation and leading laboratory services, they focus on improving the integrity and safety of the world we live in. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the side window by clicking on the small green icon in the upper right-hand corner of the side window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Andrew Tipler. Andrew Tipler is the manager of the Chromatography Research and Technology Group and has been with Perkin Elmer for 30 years. He is responsible for developing new technologies and applications for the company's GC product line. These include gas chromatographs, headspace samplers, and thermal desorption systems. Andrew has been awarded over 30 patents for innovations in GC and has presented papers at many international symposia. In addition, he is also a recognized beer judge and an avid home brewer. Thank you for joining us today. Andrew, please go ahead and get us started. Thank you, Kristen. Hello, everybody. Um, in analytical chemistry, we have a lot of uh, topics we can talk about, and uh, I have to say one of my favorite is talking about beer analysis. Um, very popular with uh, many audiences talking about beer. And uh, it, it is October, and uh, October is a very popular month for beer brewing, so this is a very appropriate uh, presentation that uh, I'll be giving. So here's a few facts on, on, on beer. It, it's been around a long time. It goes right back to uh, almost 10,000 years ago. Um, really became uh, instrumental, as this quote here from uh, Wikipedia says, uh, in the formation of civilizations, which uh, gives you a bit to think about, I suppose. Um, and it also originated really seriously in the, in the Middle East, in Sumeria, around about uh, 5,000 years ago. And historically, it, it, it was very key, especially in the Middle Ages, when uh, drinking water was uh, probably not the safest of things to do and could be highly toxic to your health. Drinking beer was, was quite a sanitary alternative to drinking water. so. Historically, you know, uh, people working in the fields were given rations of beer on, on ships and were given beer. So beer was a very, very important uh, commodity to, to stay healthy uh, in historical times. There's a few statistics here also about the, the, the size of the beer production around the world. It is the world's most widely consumed uh, alcoholic beverage, and it's the third most popular drink in the world next to uh, tea and uh, uh, water. Um, just, just look at these figures on the amount of beer sold last year, 169 billion liters. You have quite a party with that lot, I would think, um, representing something like $500 billion. So it's um, quite an important market, and it's, it's also a growing market, um, especially these craft beers seem to be becoming more and more popular. and. Uh, are doing a lot to make um, growth of beer. 
So it, it's very important, not only from you know the sort of academic interest point of view, but also from the commercial point of view that uh, we have methods of assessing and monitoring and controlling the quality of the beer that, that's produced, which is really what this uh, this uh, presentation is all about. So before I get into the analysis, let's let's just talk a little bit about how beer is, is produced. Um, unlike wine, which is you just crush the grapes and put them in a big vat and wait, beer, there's, there's quite a process to. Um, so you have to uh, take your grain and grind it up and roast it to create malt, and then you mash the malt in hot water to convert starch to sugars. You boil it all up with hops, ferment it, store it, condition it, put it in bottles or kegs, sell it, distribute it before you can start to drink it. And that whole process takes uh, anything from two weeks to two years. So what's better than making beer? Well, obviously drinking it. So uh, most of us don't make beer, but a lot of us do drink it. So this is where you know the, 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 the human interest comes in mainly. And drinking beer is, is, is not just a case of um, drink it out of the bottle. If you want to taste good beer, you'd never drink out of a bottle, all right? So um, you have to be, uh, you have to take a certain approach to it. It's, it's a bit like drinking a fine red wine. You need a special glass and you pour the beer in the bottom so that you can actually appreciate the beer at its best. And the reason for this is that much of the taste is all to do with the aroma, all right? So um, if you can't, detect the aroma, then you're not really tasting the beer. Okay, 85% of the taste comes from the aroma of a product like beer. And so, consequently, the beer aroma and the factors affecting it are of critical interest to the brewing industry. So, traditionally, um, brewers will employ tasters that are experienced and highly uh, knowledgeable about tasting beer to make subjective assessments on the beer as it comes off the production line or if there's any um, faults in the beer, they want to sort of track down these tasters uh, are, are instrumental in, in, in performing such uh, diagnoses. Um, but the problem is that uh, you do need experience, so that takes time, and you do need a, a very sensitive nose to do that. And even so, it, it, it can be still a little bit variable. Um, you know, if you've had a... I don't know. Uh, if you had kippers for breakfast, it'd probably be pretty difficult to uh, to taste beer effectively. So it it is subjective as well. So really, what's required is a, a more analytical approach that could provide a, a complement to the uh, the sensory perception. So if you've got sed sensory data and analytical data, you have a much fuller characterization of the beer you're trying to assess. So let's first start to look at the uh, instrumentation side of things. Okay, so here's a uh, picture of a typical system for aroma analysis in a brewery. Um, it's a GC mass spec headed up by a headspace sampling system. So the headspace sampling system will take the beer sample, extract the volatile content from it, which includes the aroma compounds, of course, uh, the, the gas chromatograph will separate those compounds and deliver them to a mass spectrometer where the identity of individual components can be established and even quantified. Um, problem with this is that uh, how do we correlate this with the sensory perception? One of the answers is that uh, we have a device called an olfactory port that actually takes some of the uh, effluent from the separation column to the user's nose so the user can smell compounds as they loop from the uh, chromatograph at the same time that uh, uh, the mass spectrometer is identifying and quantifying the components. So in this way we can get both uh, the sensory perception and, and the analytical data from a single run. This picture shows the full system now. So we've got the headspace sampling system, the GC, the mass spec, and now we've added the olfactory port. What I'd like to do in the uh, following slides is just go through each 
each component in turn just to explain its function and uh, what, what it does. So let's start with the headspace system. You remember the picture I showed you of the aroma coming off the uh, beer glass? Well, headspace is not so different. So we take a sample of beer, we put it into a glass vial like this. This vial holds about 22 milliliters of, of sample. We crimp a cap, or there are screw caps we can put on, and we put it in a, an oven at a slightly elevated temperature for a period of time. So what happens is that the volatile components, in other words, those components that contain the aroma compounds, uh, move, migrate from the beer into the headspace, as it's called, above the, uh, the beer inside the vial. So over, after a period of time, we just extract a little bit of this vapor and introduce it into the GC column. That's the basis of uh, headspace analysis. So it's very, very easy in terms of sample preparation. You just put a, a fixed volume of your beer into a vial like this and, and seal it. Um, it's essentially as easy as that. Okay, this, this slide shows the molecules in, in, inside the vial. And you can see there's a tendency for the heavy molecules to remain in the beer sample, whereas the volatile molecules will migrate into the headspace phase. So one of the big beauties of headspace analysis is it, it, it's great for leaving heavy stuff behind that would otherwise interfere with your chromatography or lead to long temperature programs to remove them. So it's almost a filtering step in itself. So this is why it's so easy and so powerful, headspace analysis, to look at uh, volatile compounds. In this slide, we show some of the key components in the system. I've already talked about the vial. But you see the, the block of, big block of metal at the top uh, left-hand corner of this, uh, this slide. That weighs two kilograms, and it's the oven that the uh, vials go into to be thermally equilibrated prior to analysis. Um, the partition of compounds between the beer and the headspace is very temperature dependent, and so if you want reliable and consistent results, you have to thermostat them quite, quite precisely, and that's, that's what this oven does on the uh, top right-hand side. Uh, the headspace systems that uh, Perkin Elmer produce have a, a range of auto samplers. This one shows uh, an auto sampler with 110 positions uh, on the bottom left-hand picture, and you just put your vials in there, and uh, the system does the rest. And also on this system, we have a, a, a fairly uh, easy-to-use color graphic display, touch screen, um, so you just key, key in your parameters into a screen like this to build up your uh, headspace method. Okay, so polar compounds in beer have a very high partition coefficient, which means that they like to stay in the beer and not come out into the headspace. So only a small portion of these compounds make it into the headspace, and of that portion that makes it into the headspace, only a small part of that actually makes it into the GC column because of necessary splits. So we have something called a headspace trap capability, which inserts an adsorbent trap on the outlet of the headspace file, which can effectively trap and refocus all of the headspace vapor. So you're able to heat that and desorb these trapped compounds into the GC column almost quantitatively, so you can effectively improve your detection limits by a factor of 100. So if you can do that, then you can start to detect the smell and detect on the mass uh, spectrometer peaks that you wouldn't otherwise see. So it's a, quite an important addition to this system. The first step in a headspace trap analysis is to thermostat the sample vial for a period of time, typically 20 minutes. Once that's complete, a needle goes down into the vial and carrier gas pressurizes the headspace inside that vial. We then release that pressure through an adsorbent trap. Once the pressure is released and we've loaded the trap with that uh, vapor that's come out of the vial, we can repeat, repeat the process. We can repressurize and then re-release the vapor into the trap. 
In this way, we can successively build up the quantity of uh, volatile components into the trap. Once the trap is loaded, we then heat the trap and we pass the uh, desorbed compounds into the GC column for separation and analysis. Let's move on to the gas chromatograph now. Um, so we use a regular capillary column, but we use this device called an, an S wafer, which is essentially a splitting device. So you see the, the column, which is a 60 meter uh, wax type column, very polar column, which is suitable for the sort of compounds we're going to get out of the beer, goes into this S wafer and then is effectively split between the mass spectrometer and the olfactory port. There's a uh, midpoint carrier gas supply labeled P2 on this diagram that maintains the pressure inside the S wafer. And by choosing appropriate dimensions for the two restrictors to the mass spec and the uh, olfactory port, you can define the split ratio between the two, hence the amount going to the mass spec and uh, the olfactory port to be detected. Here's just a few uh, notes on the Swafer technology. It's, it's quite a, a small device, typically the same size as a five cent coin. Um, it's made from wafers that are laser etched and then bonded together, a bit like a printed circuit board, I suppose. And this particular design has got seven input-output ports if necessary. They're all chemically deactivated and they're very easy to uh, remove and replace. Different types of swafer exist. The one we're using the D is an S swafer but we can swap it for other types or replace it if, if you know, there's any problems with it. Part of the challenge in setting up methods that involve active splitting with restrictors like this is what geometry restrictor do you choose? So a, a calculator ships with the product and you can just key in your column dimensions and you key in the flow rates you want and it'll tell you what restrictors to use. So this makes it very, very easy to develop methods based on this, this Swafer system. I'm not going to say anything more about the GC at this point. Um, performs a separation on that uh, carbon wax column, and then the effluent, some of it goes to the mass spec, some goes to the olfactory board. Now a mass spectrometer is a very, very powerful tool to have in a system like this, and I'll, I'll show you an example. So here I have uh, four chromatograms from uh, some hot samples in this case. And you can see uh, the top one is Centennial, then we've got Halatau, Goldings, and then Sars at the bottom. And you see on the Halatau one, the second one down, I've highlighted a little box. If we expand that up, this is the detail inside that little box. And you see I've highlighted one of the chromatographic peaks with an arrow. So we can do a library search on the spectrum so here's the spectrum, and then we can do a live research on this, and it can tell us what it is. In this case, it's Linan Lu, if I can pronounce it properly, um, which is a very uh, key component in beer. It's sort of got a sort of a flowery, aromatic flavor. Um, very, very important to, to brewers, particularly those on the west coast of the United States. And you could run a standard of linear law, and you could quantitate actually how much of the uh, uh, of this compound is, is is in the sample. And of course, you could do this for every other peak that you detect in the chromatogram, every other aroma compound. So you can build up a uh, profile of the aromatic compounds using this GC mass spec with headspace trap method. To tie it in with the olfactory aspect, let's look at the uh, olfactory ports uh, component of this system. So conceptually, an olfactory port is, is fairly straightforward. You've got your column in the GC, and some of the effluent is split out through a transfer line, which contains the restrictor that you saw on an earlier figure. And at the end of this transfer line, we, we fit a nozzle. And the user puts their nose into this nozzle, and they will smell the 
the uh, compounds as they loop from the DC column. You see there's a humidifier at the bottom right-hand corner, and, and, and that takes a supply of air through a bubbler containing water and into the nozzle. So you've got a supply of moist air going into the nozzle. Um, if you don't do this, then over a period of time, your nose starts to dry out, nasal membranes stop working, and your sense of smell gets impaired. So to keep the air humidified going across your nose means that you can smell well <laughs> for a longer period of time. Here's a picture of the olfactory port uh, that we've just introduced. and is, is creating quite a bit of interest on this uh, Headspace DC mass spec system, particularly in the brewing industry. It's, it's got the name SNFR, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it now. Whilst you're smelling individual peaks, if I can put it that way, you want to somehow record your perceptions. There are two ways of doing this. One is to actually narrate. So the device has an inbuilt microphone. So while you're smelling, you've got your nose in the nozzle, you're seeing the peaks coming out on the screen in front of you. You actually describe what you smell. And if you look at the bottom of this uh, figure, you can see there's, there's sort of an audio stream uh, sort of waveform. So when you say something, it gets recorded and it will register as a disturbance on this audio stream line. So when you come back to review it, you've got the chromatogram, you've got the audio stream there, you can click with your mouse anywhere on there and it will play back what you actually said at that moment in time. You also see that there's also a intensity stream uh, present on this uh, figure. So at the same time that you're recording the audio, you can be using a joystick, push it hard if it's a strong smell, push it a little bit if it's a, a subtle smell. So you can actually record your perception of intensity. So at the end of the analysis, a report file is created. It's in a Excel format, so you can read it straight into Excel and import it into whatever documents you want. And the system will convert what you say into text. So it does automatic uh, speech to text conversion and records this, this file as a result. You see this, this file also has the intensity data in it as well. So you've got the retention time, you've got the uh, description, and you've got the intensity. Let's have a look at some real beer analysis now. So let's start with a chromatogram of beer. So what you're looking for is good peak shape, um, good separation between the peaks, good detection limits, repeatable response, and linear response. You see some of the peaks on, on this chromatogram are, are labeled, so we've identified a lot of the peaks in this particular beer sample. So we could be analyzing these by the mass spectrometer and smelling them on the olfactory port. One of the ways this information could be used is, is to actually make comparisons between different beers. And this is actually information provided to us from a uh, brewery. And I'm probably not allowed to say this, but they were looking at some competitive beers, and they were looking at some of their own beers, and they were trying to sort out what was responsible for the difference in character between them. And you see on the left-hand side here, there's a table of compound names and, and their retention times and it's been plotted as a histogram on the right-hand side, so they can make direct comparison of the amounts of various compounds, aroma compounds, within the, uh, the beers themselves. Another application might be to develop a beer from scratch, so you've, you've got some idea of what you're looking for, and so you can brew beer, you can analyze it, you can see how it matches up against expectations, you can compare it against the last batch you made, is it better? Is it worse? Again, you've got the olfactory information at hand, and you've got the mass spectrometry at hand as well. Another way it could be used is to look at raw materials. So here's some orange peel that's used in a Belgian white ale. And so you want to look at the different suppliers. Obviously, some orange peel is better than other orange peel. So if you want the best product, you want to get the best orange peel for the job. So tools like this can can help you uh, arrive at that. 
Uh, Kristen mentioned that uh, I do do some home brewing from time to time, so we decided to do a project on some of the home brew that I've made, and so we monitored the development of the beer as it fermented, and, and so this slide gives you an indication of what this beer was. It's a sort of American pale ale style using English and Munich malts and a bunch of uh, American hops, even a New Zealand hop in there somewhere. And uh, fairly regular gravity beer, 1058, um, single infusion mash. So we brewed this and we started to ferment it and then we monitored the change in the beer profile with time. And here's a series of chromatograms, probably a little bit too small to see, but I think you can tell uh, just by looking at it that the top one was before we added yeast, and the bottom one was about 100 hours later with uh, you know, sort of equal time distances between each of the chromatograms. And you can see some peaks sort of came and went, some, some went completely, some came from nothing. So sort of thing you can do with this sort of information, and, and, and this was a very big um, issue for the particular brewery we, we did this work with, as you'll see on the next slide. So there are two compounds which are classed as defects in beer. One is dimethyl sulfide, and the other is diacetyl. Um, with a few exceptions, these are normally unwelcome in most beers. So a lot of uh, time and effort goes in to make sure that uh, they're, they're kept to a minimum in, in, in the beer. Diacetyl is uh, quite an interesting compound in, in that it's actually created uh, during the fermentation, but then is reabsorbed by the yeast in the later stages of fermentation. And so it can be used as, as, as sort of a marker to tell you when the beer has actually finished fermenting. So here's a couple of graphs showing over that 100 hours or 111 hours in this case, how the concentration of those two compounds changed. And as I say, it's the diacetyl one that is of particular interest. You see it's sort of gone down to sort of negligible levels after about 100 hours. This really means at that point it's ready to start the filtering and the chilling and the bottling process. So you can actually start to uh, process your beer into bottles at that point. I think up until this brewery had done this work, uh, they had been waiting a further three days waiting for the fermentation to finish. So they essentially saved, I think, about 15% on the time needed to ferment out beer. Well, that 15% actually translates into um, throughput. So they became a lot more productive as a result of work like this. The other aspect I'd like to talk about is actually analyzing hops. So hops come from all over the world, and I, I show this slide because of the second one on the list. I, I never realized that until I did a bit of research, that actually Ethiopia is the world's second most producer of, of hops, not far behind Germany. And I was rather hoping the United Kingdom would be up there somewhere, but it's, it's lagging way behind. Now, hops are added to beer for a number of purposes. Um, bittering uh, gives it its bitter flavor and also helps with the uh, preservation of beer, and also the flavor aroma compounds, which are in the essential oils at, at the bottom there. If we look at those flavor aroma compounds in oil, uh, there's three particular compounds that are of interest, myosin, humulin, and uh, cariofilin and uh, farnesine. Um, so these are the sort of things we ought to be looking for in the, uh, in the chromatography and in the olfactory port. So why analyze hops? Well, you want to see if they're any good before you use them rather than afterwards. So QC is important find out you know, if they're in good condition or if, have they oxidized. Um, development, how would you choose one hop over another? And correlating with the, uh, the final product, just because you add certain hops doesn't mean that uh, 
you're going to get the expected result in the final beer. So I'll show you some chromatography of some hops. So these are the four chromatograms I showed you earlier um, of Centennial, Halatau, uh, East Kent, Goldings, and Sarts. You see some of these key compounds are identified in, in this chromatogram. So this slide shows the analysis of the Halatau with, with some further peaks identified. If you look at these peaks, they, they tend to be fairly polar peaks, particularly a lot of acids in there, um, which sort of indicates oxidation. In other words, this is indicative of these hops being uh, very old, which, in fact, they were. I think they've been in my refrigerator for about three years, so they've really gone off. So you can pick up a lot about the quality of these hops just by looking at uh, chromatographic traces like this. So this really brings the talk to a conclusion. Um, I've, I've shown a, a system that uh, well characterizes beer and hop aroma by correlating both hard analytical data against um, organoleptic perception. It's, once it's set up, it's very easy to use. You, you just need to put your sample in a headspace vial and crimp it and uh, put it on a tray and press a button and away it, it'll go. The mass spec is a very important component. It, it gives you an insight into the identity and the amount of uh, these aroma compounds in the sample, and it's a great complement uh, to the olfactory uh, perception that you get just by smelling these compounds. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, contributors to this work. That's the Long Trail Brewery up in Vermont, and also a, a local homebrew store uh, run by Mark and Tess Samatsulski, who uh, supplied a lot of the hops uh, that I use for this work. So with that, I'd like to hand you back to Kristen, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andrew, for that informative presentation. Before we begin the, the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by type of them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the red Q&A widget at the bottom of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Andrew, it looks like we have a lot of questions that came in. So our first question is, how long does a typical analysis take? Andrew, our first question came in. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Oh, great. Um, so I could repeat that question, Andrew. Um, how long? No, I you got it. So, uh, so thank you. Yes, thank you, Kristen. Um, sorry, I was grappling a bit with technology here. Um, yeah, the length of the run really depends on the co complexity of the sample. Um, really, you 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 want you you don't want a short run because all your peaks start to get close together, and and then your nose can't really uh, distinguish between the adjacent peaks as they pollute from the column. So really, you want to maximise the distance between. Uh, the adjacent peaks, and, and you do this by having a fairly long column with a, a fairly thick film so that you get a good uh, long separation so that you can distinguish the peaks. So typically, um, I, I would suggest something like a, an hour is perhaps appropriate for this sort of chromatography, this sort of application, but you can make it shorter. If, if you've got a very fast nose, you can make it shorter still, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, our next question is, how do I handle highly carbonated beers? Okay, what, what can happen is if you're not careful and you put your beer in the headspace file and uh, you seal it and it goes into the instrument, a lot of beers have a lot of uh, carbonation in them. They can start to froth up and foam and, and it, it, it's not quite the sort of scenario you want when you're uh, connecting it to a, a GC column and a mass spectrometer. So uh, what a lot of people do is, is, is just filter the beer through some filter paper and that has the effect of taking out the carbonation. So if you want flat beer, put it through a, a piece of filter paper. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, our next question is, does the beer change while it's waiting in the rack for analysis? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, 
fermentation is uh, an ongoing process. So, you know, if you if you have a lot of samples in the uh, the rack waiting for analysis and, and fermentation is still active, then obviously, you know, the composition of the samples can change over time. In which case, it is probably wise to do what we call feed the uh, the system. So, just put a couple of vials in and. Uh, as, as they get analyzed, just keep topping it up. But obviously, once the beer is finished, um, there's, there's no issues like that. So finished beer, um, raw ingredients, you know, you, you, you don't have to worry. It's only if you're trying to study the process itself, you've got to be a little bit careful about that. Great. Thank you. All right. Our next question is, have you ever tried um, with other sampling methods such as SPME? Uh, yes, there's a, obviously you can use a variety of, of, of methods. SPME is, uh, is, is a good alternative. Um, the difference is instead of having an external trap that you feed the, uh, the headspace vapor into it and concentrate, you actually put a, a, a sort of a probe, a coated probe into the headspace file itself and the uh, molecules in the headspace get uh, absorbed into the surface of that um, Fiber. Um, I mean, both have their advantages and disadvantages. I, I, I would say the headspace trap is perhaps better because it's much quicker. It, it takes a long time to absorb uh, a lot of the material into the, the, the fiber surface, whereas the headspace trap, it's you, you, you collaborate for about 20 minutes and, uh, and and you're done. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. All right, our next question is, how well does the timing match up between the chromatogram being viewed and the aroma being observed? Well, that's, that's a good question, and it, it, it's one that gets asked quite a, quite a lot. Um, yeah, you, you, you've got pieces of fused silica um, at the end of the column connected to that swafer. Uh, one goes to, the, to your nose, the other goes to the detector. Um, the flow rate down these bits of uh, few silica tubing, uh, typically just a, a few milliliters a minute. But if you look at the velocity, it, it, it can be over a meter, meter a, a minute or more. So the actual residence time inside the uh, restricted tube is, is a fraction of a second normally. So um, there is a potential difference in time, but you, you, you wouldn't notice it. All right, it's just a fraction of a second. I mean, we did think at one point having an extra long uh, transfer line uh, restricted to you going to the mass spec so that you could see the peaks coming out, and then it would give you time to get your nose into the nozzle to, to smell them. And we thought that might, uh, that might be a little bit confusing, but it, it, it could be convenient to do it that way. So um, you could go either way, really. So normally we, we, we try and keep them uh, simultaneous. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, our next question is, can this technology be used on other alcoholic beverages? Uh, yes. I mean, not just alcoholic beverages. A uh, variety of, of, of samples where you're concerned about the aroma, cheese, wine, uh, perfumes. Well, I suppose you eat perfumes, but uh, you could use it for perfume. So you could look at... Uh, all sorts of raw materials that are used in food. If you've got an off flavor, you want to know what it is, you can, you can use a, a, a technique like this. In fact, we've, we've done quite a few applications uh, on, on this technology recently, and if you go to our website, you'll, you, you, you can find them. And generally, we're using the same system, the same method, the same column for just about all of them. So yes, it is quite, uh, quite good for a variety of different types of sample. Thank you. The next question is, what sort of temperature is used in the GC, and then it says inlet column oven, to avoid any potential degradation of the aromas? Okay, that's another excellent question. I mean, most aroma compounds are, are pretty stable inside the GC column. The, the, the column itself is made out of deactivated fused silica with a fairly inert surface. I mean, if it wasn't in uh, your, your chromatography would look uh, would look rubbish. So um, most compounds do uh, do do a loop fairly fairly intact. I mean, some like the terpenes may may, may break down, but uh, generally not. Um, if it is a concern, then obviously you've got a special case there. Perhaps consider a column with a, a thinner stationary face loading. 
so you can get your peaks out at a lower temperature and perhaps help overcome that. Great, thank you. Our next question is, what sorbent material was used in the trap in the headspace system? Okay, in, in this case we used uh, a, a trap that we use for a lot of applications uh, where volatile compounds are involved and we, we call it the air toxics trap because it's also used on our thermal desorption systems for monitoring uh, toxic compounds in the air. Um, it, it's a good uh, absorbent combination for, for this type of application because it can retain a lot of the uh, volatile alcohols and testers uh, uh, and things like that very, very well. It's actually a combination of a, a carbon black and a carbon molecular sieve. Thank you. Our next question is, are the hops extracted before analysis? If so, what solvent is used? Okay, another, another good question. Um, although I didn't show it in the presentation, um, there, there are different ways of presenting the hops in, in the Headspace file. Um, I suppose it, it sort of depends on the purpose for the analysis. If you just want to do QC, you know, how good are the hops, you, you, you probably just want to put the raw hops in there like, like I did for, for, for this application. So um, I put it in a grinder, I ground them up, I put a gram into the uh, Headspace file and I just ran it. Uh, I did try making some hop tea, that's by putting a bit of water into the uh, Headspace file at the same time, but now you've got chemistry taking place so the results you get look a bit different from if it was a dry sample. So if you wanted to know how it, how the hops reacted with water, I, I suppose you could do this with the beer, it's the, the, the beer itself if, if, if you wanted. So I think it really depends on the purpose of the analysis, all right? So if you're studying the chemistry of hops in hot liquids, then by all means add some liquid and you can, you can get some quite interesting data out of it. But if you're just looking at uh, QC, I, I would suggest you don't bother with a uh, uh, water or, or a solvent. Generally, we don't use solvents uh, in headspace because they're obviously going to come out with a sample into the GC column and now instead of, instead of having a nice clean chromatogram, you can have a great big solvent peak in the middle of it, so it's generally not, not recommended. So, um, yeah, I, I just use the hops as they were. Thank you. Our next question is, could technique be used to detect volume pollutants in water? Valium? I'm sorry, it's quite catch the question. Sure, it's Can you ask it again? Sure. Could technique be used to detect volume pollutants in water? Valium. Um, oh, I mean, I'm his space. Sorry, Kristen. Say, I'm sorry, say vo volatile pollutants. Volatile, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. Thallium, that's a, that's a drug you should take to make you feel better, isn't it? Um, <laughs> volatile pollutants, yes. Um, the headspace trap is ideal for that. It's, it's very similar to the perfect trap technique in that um, most of the volatiles in the water will go into the headspace if you heat the water slightly. And if you can extract the majority or even all of the headspace into the trap, fire it into the GC column, then you've got a very effective way of looking at volatiles in water. So yes, we have done work with uh, the standard EPA um, uh, VOC methods in, in, in water and it, it, um, it certainly does work well. And we do have an application note out on that, which I think you can get from our, our website. Great, thank you. Our next question is, how much variation between individuals is there in detectability of the volatile compounds produced? Oh, another good question. Uh, there's, there's probably more variation in the sample, I would think, than what you'd see from the instrumentation. So I think it has a lot to do with, you know, how the sample is prepared, how it's homogenized. I mean, obviously, hops are a, a, a sort of organic vegetable material, and you know, you could have two plants next to each other in a in a field, and they they will give slightly different profiles depending on whether one sees more sun than the other, that sort of thing. So you are going to see quite a bit of variation. But if if you could deliver this exactly the same sample into each of the vials, then then you would be within a few percent, I would say, of each other in terms of computation. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. 
like All right. Our next question is, please repeat type sorbent trap or give spelling. Okay. Uh, if you go to the Perkinawa website, I believe you can order something called an air toxics trap. So it's A-I-R-T-O-X-I-C-S. Okay. And as I say, it, it's got some carbonaceous uh, absorbents in it. Great. Thank you. Our next question is, do you normally use a one-to-one -one split between MS and olfactory port? Okay. Um, you can really use any combination you like, I would say, within, within reason. Probably the maximum flow rate you should take down one of these restrictors is probably the order of 20 milliliters a minute. Um, the flow rate down the other one can be down to 100 microliters a minute or less. So, so you've got some flexibility there. I think it really depends on why you're doing the work. I mean, some, some people, uh, when they use these systems, are not only looking at the aroma, but they're also trying to look at trace level of the compounds like the diacetyl and the DMS, in which case they probably want most of it to go to the mass spec so that they can detect these compounds. Uh, other people, probably including myself, don't have a very good sense of smell, so you want more to go uh, to the olfactory port. But uh, for, for this work, I think it was about a, uh, a four to one split. It, it, it sort of had it on one of the earlier slides, I think, but I, I, I think it was about that. Great, thank you, Andrew. Our next question is, does a list or database of the common aromas contained in beer exist? And the second part is together with usual quantitative level. Okay, that's, that's probably a question that's going to take a, a bit of a long answer. I think probably the best thing to do is, is, is to communicate um, after the presentation. There are obviously a lot of books out there on hops, a lot of papers on hops. I mean, I could make some recommendations, but uh, it would be difficult to do here and now. So if anybody wants that information, um, I'm not too sure how they best get in touch with us, Kristen, but I'm, I'm not sure that's possible. Yep, we, we can contact them. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Our next question is, can I use the olfactory device on my other GCs? Um, well, obviously, we, we can really do anything. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Somebody knocked on the door. <laughs> I'm actually in a hotel in Michigan at the moment doing this, so it's uh, quite quite a novelty for me. No problem. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, you have to really look at it as a system. So we've got the olfactory port, we've got the GC with the swafer in it, we've got the headspace trap, we've got the mass spec. I think we feel that most users would like to buy the complete system and see it up and running, so that's the way we're offering it. So. Um, it sort of takes away all the pain from, from the user having to plug these things up and connect them and get them working and that. So we, we, we treat it as a system. So um, that's, that's the reason why we only offer it on our, our, our particular instruments. Thank you. It looks like we have time just for a few more questions. Our next question is, for those of us in noisy labs, can the audio recorder feature be turned off and on? The answer is yes. And also in the kit, you will get a, a headset with a boom microphone, which actually I'm working at the uh, wearing at the moment, so you can tell how well it works. Um, and that that way, you know, the noise in the lab is is, is not interfering what you hear or, or or what you speak. Great, thank you. All right, our final question is: How reliable is a speech to text transcription? Yes, I, it probably depends on whether or not you've got a funny accent like mine. Um, so we, we actually use a commercial product to, to do the text to, uh, sorry, the speech to text translation. And there's an excellent training uh, algorithm in there. So before you use the product, you, you need to sit down for about 15 minutes and uh, train it on your own particular voice. And if you do that, it, it does seem to be remarkably uh, 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 reliable. Uh, of course, what you've got to watch out for is that it's listening to everything you say. So, you know, if you stop to have a conversation with a colleague at 
it's still on, then all of this goes into your uh, narration file, which can make life a little bit interesting later. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's reasonably good, and you can uh, you can always go in and sort of edit the uh, the spelling mistakes if you find any. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew, for your insightful answers and educational presentation today. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to say thank you to everybody who joined us and participated by submitting questions for our expert in today's event. Please note, if we did not get to your question, we will follow up via email. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, for making today's educational webcast possible. Please note, this webcast will be posted for on-demand viewing through October of 2014. You will receive an email from LCGC alerting you when it is available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.